U.S.-Iran tensions are pushed to a new height after attacks on oil tankers in the Gulf of Oman. The U.S. has accused Iran of being behind the attacks and has repositioned its forces in the region. Are we looking at a potential military conflict? What do Washington's allies think of U.S. policy towards Iran? Where does Japan fit into the turmoil? And how will it further impact global oil prices? To discuss these issues and more, I'm happy to be joined by Mr. Hua Liming, former Chinese ambassador to Iran, and Rick Dunham, visiting scholar of Tsinghua University. We shall also cross over with Gamba Nadari, columnist with Keihan International in Tehran, and Professor Takasato Watanabe from Dorchester University in Kyoto. That's our topic. This is Dialogue. I'm Yang Rei. Welcome to our discussion here, gentlemen. Speculations are rampant at this moment, but whom do you think should be held responsible for the tanker attacks? The, at the first time, the United States, Saudi Arabia, and the uh, UK, they accused uh, Iran, did that see. But I think it's illegal, uh, it's, it's uh, illogical and stupid for Iran to do that. Iran doesn't need a war with the United States, doesn't need a military confrontation with it. What Iran needs is to lift the sanctions against any of the, the sanctions. So um, the Iran doesn't uh, want the confrontation with it. It doesn't make any sense for Iran I to provoke the international community. I don't, I don't uh, think so. International even, community. even the United States itself that cannot afford such kind of war with Iran because Iran is a, it is so large country much bigger than Iraq and Afghanistan. I, I don't think the United States can afford a war with Iran. But uh, Rick, who are therefore behind the attacks if Iran doesn't make any sense if uh, uh, or should Tehran be involved in the deliberative provocation? Well, first I say we don't know. <laughs> you don't know. Uh, we, and, you know, we, I, we, all we know is that the United States and Saudi Arabia say Iran did it. Iran said it did not do it. Let me put and, the question and, this and way, the, the allies of the U.S. are really reluctant, other than a few Tories in the U.K. They are skeptical of the U.S. explanation. Let me put my question this way, Ambassador Hua and the Rick. Uh, who will be the biggest beneficiary or winner of this uh, tanker attacks. Very quickly, your reply. That's the focus of the problem. Because neither side of the United States of Iran uh, need that, that kind of a military competition. But there are some, some people, parties. For example? For, for example, Saudi Arabia, Israel. They don't want to see the escalation of the tensions between the U.S. and Iran. So I, I, I don't have any evidence to say that Saudi Arabia and Israel did that. But they are happy to see that the tension be between the U.S. and Iran now is, is, is getting more and more. Let me cross over to our uh, Tehran guest speaker who's standing by uh, on satellite. Uh, Bobby, what do you think of uh, the role of a non-state actor such as ISIL? Uh, the scattered troops of ISIL could still pose a serious threat to the um, uh, security of the Gulf of Oman, other than, for example, allegations about the possible involvement of uh, Israel and Saudi Arabia? Well, that's a very good question, and many people are, uh, want some answers to that, uh, Young. I think the biggest beneficiary of any standoff between Iran and the United States, first of all, has to be the, the military-industrial complex in the United States that enjoys a full support of the Trump administration and, and, all, and, of course, Trump himself, who is now laughing all the way to the bank after signing uh, arms deal with Saudi Arabia worth over $100 billion. At the same time, this, this easily justifies the presence of U.S. warships and military personnel in the volatility entire region of Persian Gulf, and also it serves the geostrategic uh, and political interests of Saudi Arabia and Israel. They wouldn't mind to see another war in the region, this time between Iran and the United States. Why? Because they are going to see Iran uh, turn into another uh, failed state 
like its allies, uh, uh, Iraq and Syria. So, so you, as you just argued, Iran doesn't stand to, to win anything from this com confrontation and attack. And, and America also is not going to, to win big because it is going to be hugely dissatisfied by, by, by having another, yet another failed uh, regime change campaign uh, uh, in this volatile region. But as I told you, Saudi Arabia, the military industrial complex, and of course Israel, and at the same time the terrorist groups that, like ISIL. Let's not forget the fact that ISIL, yes, has been dislodged from Iraq and Syria, but its remnants are everywhere, still everywhere, even in Afghanistan, even in Pakistan, even in, in Yemen. So they also stand to win big time. Yes, indeed. Uh, no one questioned uh, the happiness of President Trump, who seized this opportunity very quickly to discredit, for example, the Revolutionary Guard of the Iranian uh, Republic. Let me cross over to Professor Watanabe for your perspective on the timing. Why do you think the attacks occurred exactly during Prime Minister Shinzo Abe's visit in Tehran? And the uh, tankers uh, are allegedly listed in Japan. There are two reasons for that. One is military speaking. You see the tankers, the, they, one of them belongs to the Mitsubishi uh, heavy industry. Mitsubishi is one of the biggest military industry in Japan. So this implies that Iran wanted to give the, some cautions not to be with the United States furthermore Second one is, is the economic problem. The, uh, <coughs> Iran wants to export oil to outside. If not, they want to, you see, the, the people are put into difficulty I even in the living. So uh, these activities of Iran are the caution to the people and the government of United States and also to the Japanese people. So these are very simple. Iran and America both want to have tension to some extent to give the satisfaction of the inside the people. One, United States politically, uh, the uh, Iran, the other one, the economically. The people's life is very hard now in Iran. They want to export uh, oil to outside. Yeah, many observers who follow the diplomatic maneuvers of Prime Minister Shinzo Abe are indeed very much sorry for the devastating setbacks and embarrassing setbacks for Tokyo to uh, try in vain to broker a peace talk between Tehran and Washington. But uh, let me come back to the Beijing studio. Rick, uh, do you think the United States have any allies? I mean, do you think the United States has any allies on the uh, cancellation of the Iran nuclear deal? Because uh, Europeans, other than the UK, which offered to back the military confrontation with Tehran, um, uh, Germans and French uh, openly expressed their dissatisfaction about the whims and unpredictability of the presidency of Donald Trump, particularly regarding the uh, nuclear deal. I think where it comes to the deal, Trump doesn't have any allies in Europe. Uh, even the British. Uh, when it comes to military escalation, I think that there's great skepticism, as particularly in Germany. Uh, but uh, I th and I think it would be an internal political battle in in the UK between hawks and doves. But really, we have the, it boils down to Trump having a credibility problem. Um, allies don't trust him. He's unpredictable. He's mercurial. He says things and then he changes his mind and he says things that are outrageous. And so if you're an ally of the U.S., you don't want to go along. They see what happened in 2003 with the war in Iraq, the invasion of Iraq, with evidence being manufactured. And that was with a president who was less mercurial than uh, Donald Trump. And so I think that they want to take it slowly. They don't want, uh, they don't want to be forced out of Iran by u unilateral U.S. sanctions. And they definitely don't want to be involved in uh, any kind of military situation, and they don't want to choose sides. So right now, I think Europe would rather have this thing go away, but it looks like the hawks around Donald Trump do not want it to go away, especially Secretary of State Pompeo and National Security Advisor Bolton. I mean, they've been all over the Sunday talk shows in the United States uh, saying um, very critical things about Iran, stoking the fire.
but I'm afraid the European Union is not a long, it's not a long way. For example, the Chinese government uh, seems to share the same position with the European Union on the latest development in the Gulf of Oman. The Chinese spokesperson of the foreign ministry urges uh, caution on this particular issue. What do you think of the um, uh, identical views uh, shared by the EU and the Chinese government? Of course, China doesn't stand with the United States on a withdrawal from the GCPOA, I call it, the Iranian nuclear, uh, nuclear agreement. And uh, actually, on the GCPOA issue, the United States is uh, totally isolated because nobody is, uh, is supporting the U.S. position, including the U.K., France, and uh, Germany. Of course, China and Russia don't agree with that. So uh, for China, I think the stability and peace in the, in the Gulf and the Middle East is very important because 60% uh, of China's imported oil is from that area. So China uh, needs the stability and the peace in that area, don't want to see any military confrontation, any military conflicts in that area. For many of our viewers, um I'm afraid they don't have a clear idea about the importance of the Gulf of Oman and why so much of the oil flow has to go through this important but volatile region in the Middle East. Let me cross over to Bobby. Um, can you brief us quickly on how important uh, the Gulf of Oman or the Gulf of Hormuz could be because the Iranian authorities threatened to block the Gulf of Hormuz should hostilities break out between Tehran and Washington. What are your thoughts? Well, well let's not forget the fact that uh, uh, the pipelines of the United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia are also within the striking distance of Iranian missiles. So even if they, they try to close the Strait of Hormuz, be it Iran or Saudi Arabia and the United States, they cannot export oil through their pipelines and, uh, and through the port of Fujaira and, and then later to the Gulf of Oman and the Sea of Oman and, and the international markets. So, so, so let's make one thing absolutely clear. It's either oil exports for everybody for no oil, oil exports for nobody. That's, that's the message of the Iranian government because it makes no sense for Iran not to send oil to international markets but its enemies, its rivals in the region like Saudi Arabia doing the exact opposite and being, being able to do just that because they are they happen to be allies of the United States and Israel. So, so, so your question is very straightforward. It's either for everybody or nobody. But at the moment, Iran has no intention to close the Strait of Hormuz. Why? Because it is going to cut off its own lifeline, which is oil exports. That's why Iran doesn't see any benefit in attacking any oil tankers in the Persian Gulf, because that is the last thing in the mindset of Iranian government officials. It is going to be a mad decision. It is going to be a political suicide. Why on earth should Iran invite uh, Shinzo Abe, Prime Minister of Japan, to Iran and at the same time attack its ship in the Persian Gulf? It makes no strategic sense at all. Iran seeks dialogue, uh, uh, Young. Iran seeks understanding and peace with all its neighbors, including the United States. The problem, the problem is that even now that they are accusing Iran of uh, being behind these attacks, Nobody is picking up the phone and to, to call Iran and say, what the hell is going on? They don't do that. They just simply accuse Iran of the, being behind these attacks. But they don't seek any answer. They don't call for investigation. They don't call for some kind of understanding and dialogue between Iran. Why? Because they want to isolate Iran. Why? Because Iran is not on the same page with the United States and its allies in the region. Why? Because Iran refused to allow terrorist groups to occupy Iraq and Syria and now Yemen. That's what they don't like it. Because when there is volatility in the region, when there are terrorism and extremism and insecurity, it is going to give a free right for United States government and its uh, military to come to this part of the world. And, um, and being here in the Persian Gulf, dispatching to, uh, troops in the, to the Persian Gulf doesn't mean that America is going to cough up the bill. No, it is Saudi Arabia is, going, is now 
paying and has continued to pay uh, for the presence of U.S. troops and warships in the Persian Gulf. So it's good for business. This is as good as it gets. That's why they love to see uh, tankers attack. They love to see insecurity in the region. You have successfully pressed the case for Iran not to use force, not to provoke a confrontation militarily with the United States. But the United States and President Trump, uh, who could easily flex his military muscles, uh, seems to be reluctant to be involved in a military confrontation with the Persian state, despite the pretty hawkish position of John Bolton uh, and uh, other uh, hawks in his uh, what is called the wartime cabinet in the White House. What do you think of the reluctance of the U.S. government, particularly President Trump himself? Well, the problem is people like John Bolton and, and, and Ben Salman and others, like Benjamin Netanyahu, these are the people that want war, not President Trump. President Trump wants business. Even with, with China, that it, he has waged a, a trade war and he has lost, by the way. Let's not forget that simple fact. But, but the thing is that he's a businessman. He wants to do business. He doesn't want war. That's exactly why people chose him, voted for him to become the, the 45th pres president of the United States. The problem, the problem is that there are some warmongers uh, on the Capitol Hill and, and Iran hawks that pretty much like to see Iran and America uh, be in some kind of confrontation, military confrontation in the Persian Gulf. They love to, to fail Iran and, and see that Iran becomes another failed state because they don't like Iran. They don't like the idea of an independent country in the region. So they are doing everything. The, the, the good thing is that there are still sound minds on the Capitol here and inside the, 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 the American government, including President Trump himself. They are going to put some kind of cap on these warmongers, but we don't know how long. But I can give you one, one thing. You know, I, I can give Everyone, my 100% guarantee that uh, John Bolton is going to be the fall guy here because Iran is not going under any condition to, to, to go to some kind of war with the United States and its allies. That Good news is, is not President going to Trump happen. refuses Iran to be held a hostage by President uh, John here. Bolton. Thank you very much. Let me cross over to Professor Watanabe. Uh, how did the Japanese media respond to the setbacks of uh, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe's? Uh, diplomatic maneuver in Tehran because uh, he failed to have persuaded uh, Ayatollah Khamenei to accept the offer of olive branch from the uh, White House to resume the trade talk. Uh, how did the Japanese media look at the failure of your Prime Minister's uh, diplomacy in Tehran? Japanese Prime Minister was cons considered to be the messenger boy from Trump to Iran, and also Mr. Abe, Prime Minister, wanted to be the ma major player in the settlement of the very serious you see, dangers in this area. So both Trump and Mr. Abe wanted to, to be the you see, messenger for the peace, but it failed because of the Trump's, you see, ambition, it is one of the reasons, you see. He wanted to rename the Golan Heights to Trump Heights, to the one of the plantations in, the, in that area, together with the Israeli government. But, but excuse the me, pro uh, Professor Watanabe, do you think uh, in uh, undertaking this diplomatic maneuver in Tehran, Prime Minister Abe was able to win the next election in the upper house because that's viewed uh, the real driving force behind uh, uh, his trip to Tehran. Mr. Abe, you see, uh, wanted to go there and wanted to become the good hero of the mediation or a peace mission, you see, a passenger on the global scale, but it failed because of the so com much complicated you see, So what about the prospects of the winning well, the upper house election? Ah, uh, this time, you see, some media, you see, expected him to be the successful, but most of, the, more than 80% of the media people in here, in Japan, they did not, you see, believe that Mr. Abe will be successful as the messenger boy from the Trump to Iran, and it became true this time. This is uh, no doubt. And as a politician, also as the mediator, he failed, definitely.
Thank you very much for being with us, Professor Watanabe. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, Rick, what do you think of the rise in oil prices following the tanker attacks? Well, I think the instability in the Middle East uh, and in the Gulf region uh, has driven prices up. I mean, the, obviously the uh, prices will go up every time there's an attack uh, on tankers. Also, insurance prices have gone up by more than 10 percent on the tankers uh, because they're more, they're more at risk. Um, it's, it, it is a question of supply and demand, and the demand goes down when uh, tankers can't get out of the Gulf uh, to deliver oil to the rest of the world. It's bad for the global economy. It's good for, the, for a few countries, uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, UAE, uh, Russia, uh, Iran, uh, in terms of prices going up. But I think this is a temporary thing unless there's a war. Uh, but it's, it's natural. Every, every time, uh, every time there's, there's any kind of uh, shut off of, uh, of oil exports, uh, prices go up. And that's the far more or less all member states of GCC or indeed OPEC uh, uh, blog would have to look at the issue of uh, resource occurs. Um, what do you think of the concerns of Saudi Arabia? Uh, Saudi Energy Minister Khalid Al Falih said there must be a rapid and decisive response to the threat to energy supplies, market stability, and consumer confidence after the attacks in the Gulf area. What needs to be done to achieve that goal to stabilize the price? Of course, Saudi Arabia, as a major oil producer, would be very happy to see the high price of oil. And uh, now, after the incident, the prices is going up. But uh, totally speaking, the, between the demand and the supply, uh, supply is much more than the demand. Let's so look at the issue of, uh, uh, I mean, the surge in oil prices. So do you think uh, the enormous efforts by Washington to reduce Iranian oil exports to zero would help raise the prices? So uh, really, I, I just have read a speech of uh, Mike Pompeo today that he said the United States doesn't have high stakes in this region because the United States doesn't need the, the Middle East oil. And in China, for China and Japan, is very risky. Maybe it's a conspiracy of the United States against China and Asian countries. So this is, the, uh, I really, this speech shocked me when I heard uh, Mike Pompeo said such, such things. Well, let me cross back to uh, Bobby. Um, Ambassador Hua made no secret about his uh, concerns uh, on cutting off uh, the Strait of Hormuz and cut off the oil supplies in the uh, volatile region uh, where um, one-fifth of the oil consumed global, globally would have to pass. Um, do you understand the Chinese concerns, Bobby? Absol absolutely. China, Russia, even Japan, these are our, uh, our customers, biggest customers, our biggest allies, and we don't want uh, to wish any ill on our international allies or customers. As your distinguished guest, uh, His Excellency Ambassador made it absolutely clear, uh, these countries are not going to win if there is a confrontation in the region. Uh, why? Because they want to see oil flow, energy flow to their markets, and they need it for uh, development and growth. So there is some kind of, of course, uh, uh, conspiracy here to stop the rise of China as a responsible member of the international community. They want to make sure that that China doesn't develop and grow just like the, the other economies uh, in the region and beyond. So this is some, some kind of you know, confrontation and, 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 and program by the United States and its allies to make sure that, the, that other emerging economies are not going to continue to compete with Western and American economies. So why not? This is a business, this is as business as usual for many, other, many of them because they don't need, as they, as they admitted it made it clear today, like Mike Thank Pompeo, you very much, Bobby, oil from your this region, but they also this want to make sure that issue concerning our two economies. Thank you so much, Bobby, for being with us. Ambassador Hua, um, now President Trump and Iranian Supreme Leader Ayatollah Khamenei exchanged the barbs online. Uh, uh, pre uh, I mean, uh, the spiritual leader of Iran said, quote, I do not see Trump as worthy of any message exchange, and I do not have any reply for him now or in future, quote. 
uh, what do you think would happen to the Iran nuclear capability? Because uh, Tehran made it very clear that it will suspend some of the commitments implied in the nuclear deal that was reached between the Obama administration and the other European powers. Certainly, Iran doesn't need a war with the United States. And uh, what ur urgently Iran needs is the end of the sanctions against them. And uh, Iran is using this uh, uh, GCPOA conditions as a leverage ag against the United States. Because actually the GCPOA, the, the nuclear program, a nuclear agreement between uh, five plus one, mm -hmm. uh, actually it, it's, 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 a, um, it's a nothing. Because the United States says uh, uh, it's a deal between the U.S. and Iran. And the U.S. has finished the, the uh, commitment to the, the lifting of sanctions. And Iran, uh, far from the other side, Iran can... Uh, lifting all the, the, the limitations for, for their nuclear activities. So this, this is a, uh, actually is a very risky. And if once Iran is withdrawing from the, the GCPOA, then the situation in the region is between the U.S. and Iran, between, the U between Iran and the European Union, will be very dangerous. We understand that uh, easily the European concerns on uh, nuclearization of the Persian state, but what about the prospects of uh, having an expansive uh, nuclear arms race in the Gulf between the Saudis and Persians, Rick? I think that's something Europeans in particular, but I think the world in general, I think China would agree, is a bad idea. And uh, the, with Sa the Saudis right now and the Trump family, I wouldn't rule it out that the Saudis would like to uh, get nuclear capabilities. Uh, think of how much um, more leverage they would have in the, in the uh, world and in the region. But I, I think I mean, we're talking theoretically there. I think right now uh, Iran is trying to ride out the unilateral sanctions from the United States. I think the U.S. is trying to choke the Iranian economy right now, the Trump administration, so that there will be civil unrest and regime change. Uh, and any, any kind of uh, uh, of instability is going to be bad, uh, bad for the world, bad for the world economy, and potentially at risk of uh, military confrontation because there's so many actors with interests there, I mean, from Saudi Arabia, UAE, to Israel, to Russia, to the United States, uh, to the European countries. Given the adversity and the severity of the adversity between Washington and Tehran, what do you think of the prospects of having more proxy wars in the Middle East? Uh, for example, in uh, Yemen, although in Syria, uh, that proxy war has somehow been concluded with the limited withdrawal of U.S. military personnel there. And uh, I, I believe Iran will continue their, their involvement in the Syrian war. And uh, maybe some, uh, some conditions can be negotiated in for, for Yemen situation, not, but not for Syria. Well, um, as well as blaming Iran for the tanker attacks, Washington has also said Tehran was behind the May the 14th drone strikes on two Saudi oil pumping stations. Now, Tehran has denied all those charges. Rick, what do you make of uh, say, such accusations? Uh, U.S. is making a lot of these accusations that we can't prove, and they're not publicly releasing the evidence. I mean, the evidence they did release in the uh, tanker uh, explosion in the Gulf uh, is in dispute. And so I think we're just going to see more of it. I think a lot of Americans remember uh, back to the Gulf of Tonkin before the Vietnam War, and I think a lot of Americans are worried about, uh, about a situation like that uh, starting in the Persian Gulf, and, uh, and so, so I think right now we want hard evidence. We don't want to just have assertions. Well, uh, uh, with regard to hard evidence, we have to go back to the issue of uh, chemical weapons that uh, President Bashad allegedly pursue, uh, possessed. But uh, sorry, we have to conclude this discussion. I'll see you next time for more of such interesting issues concerning the volatility of the Middle East. Until then, goodbye.